Good day, class. Welcome to our second last lecture on deviance and crime. And I'd like to begin by saying that I am grateful to those of you who submitted their um, uh, memoir uh, proposals on time. They're all marked. I'm excited to read your final memoir projects. And um, if you have any question or concern about your uh, final assignment, please bring that to tomorrow's class in the morning. Um, so uh, this week we're looking at uh, chapter five, the last chapter that will have an assignment attached to it. Next week we will look at uh, mass media and uh, recap and um, discuss the format of the final exam. So let's begin with the chapter five, Introduction to Social Construction of Deviance and Crime. This chapter looks as uh, I hope you know, having read the chapter, uh, the varieties of de deviant behavior and uh, the different theoretical uh, approaches in sociology to deviance and crime. Uh, it also asks us to think about crime as a special case of deviance on the spectrum of deviant behavior, some deviant beha behaviors as uh, conflict theory explains are actually um, expressions of social uh, behavior based on inequality, etc. So the chapter looks at social control and the discouraging methods uh, for deviance and uh, ways of punishing deviance and crime. And as I said, social inequality and uh, uh, class inequality and social stratification are elements uh, that are very significant in this chapter. So deviance is defined uh, as, quote, any behavior that diverges from usual or accepted standards and so then violates social rules. As we looked um, at socialization and cultural constructs and so on, what is um, seen as uh, the norm or the accepted standard of behavior, of course, varies across cultures. And that social uh, upbringing, the primary um, socialization processes may impart certain values that are then contradicted and problematized um, through subsequent um, socialization experiences. And essentially the book teaches us that people learn both to follow rules and to disobey or break rules through their interactions with humans uh, of various sorts. So the interactionist theory uh, specifically is geared at trying to figure out how uh, uh, people learn to be either deviant or obedient. So possible questions on the exam um, that you may encounter on based on this chapter would be, uh, a question that in a short answer asks you to describe ways to increase ethical behavior and or prevent um, violent crime in societies. And uh, another one would be to ask you to think about cyber crimes and cyber bullying. And that's a topic I'll discuss a little bit later in this lecture. So um, if we think about the different types of deviant behavior, one key term which we encountered last week already is stigmatization, which essentially is a practice of um, disgracing or marginalizing uh, people uh, or peoples of, uh, based on their um, particular circumstances or physical and social characteristics that result from those life circumstances so that the person is um, not fully uh, accepted into the social norms. Again, think of all this as contingent and very much culturally um, structured. And um, when we think about uh, regulating uh, people's behavior, um, we're talking about enforcement of so social rules. So for example, the um, kinds of practices that um, achieve uniformity. If you think back to the chapter on gender, you know, the idea that um, boys don't use makeup or that girls should have long hair, you know, those kinds of normalizing practices and um, a challenge to, you know, certain 
norms in uh, physical appearance, for example, could easily be linked to deviant behavior where there is none. If you think about, you know, punk rock or goth or, you know, these types of movements um, or people with many, many tattoos, etc., cetera, um, there's all kinds of stigma around uh, these um, physical markers that people continue to hold today. So, um, if you think back again to last week, we talked about Mikel Foucault and his work in trying to explain how uh, since the, um, uh, essentially since the Victorian period, the regular, regularization of um, and control over sexuality, as well as the introduction uh, of biopolitics and the control over the human body, um, he also coined the term governmentality, so the way in which states essentially govern the citizenry in a very kind of regulating um, way, which uh, again recalls this idea that if you fall outside of the regulations, you are likely to be stigmatized and viewed as deviant. There are all kinds of behaviors that are stigmatized as deviant, for example, sexual deviance. Um, again, if you want to read more about this, Michael Foucault would be a great place to go. Uh, he has three books on the history of sexuality. And um, sexual deviance um, is a complicated topic, uh, which I cannot cover in any to any extent here, but um, it, a simple definition would be that the society views uh, an individual's erotic gratification as um, unacceptable, somehow weird or perverted. And um, uh, in our recent history of, let's say the last couple of centuries, um, you could look at constructions of um, heterosexual sexuality as the norm and everything that falls outside of that as typically seen as deviant. Um, there are clear examples of sexual deviance that is generally seen as uh, absolutely unacceptable like pedophilia, but there are uh, many examples of um, anything outside of heterosexual sexuality uh, so sex between a man and a woman that, uh, you know, is seen as the norm and then anything that is bisexual, homosexual, or anything else as sexually deviant. And you can obviously see the problems with that. So um, the concept of social cohesion helps us to understand why uh, a community or a society tries to create these kinds of uh, norms and that um, social cohesion is achieved by the you know, subscription to these particular views. Um, so uh, another form of deviant uh, behavior the book talks about is substance abuse. So excessive use of or uh, addiction dependence uh, specifically to alcohol or any form of drug. Um, Recently in the 21st century, opioids uh, have become a very, very uh, problematic uh, drug that has led to a lot of um, deaths. Um, and so uh, every century you can say has its own uh, problems with addiction. Um, for example, if you think about the acceptance or um, the norm of smoking in the uh, 20th century and prior to 20th century today, uh, smoking has become a lot more stigmatized, right? The topic of moral panic is a huge one, but essentially it's a concept that um, uh, connotes an overreaction to uh, behaviors that are framed as uh, deviant and on the increase. So think of, you know, the kinds of examples since the mid 20th century up until now, as I mentioned, you know, uh, something like punk or rock and roll, you know, when Elvis first started shaking his hips on stage, this was seen as deviant and potentially corrupting to the youth. Um, there are anti-feminist movements that try to label feminists as somehow deviant um, 
in their understanding of society as uh, incorrect and their challenges to the patriarchy, etc. Uh, fear of terrorist attacks, and in particular since 9-11 in the US, all the manifestations of that with the recent examples of Donald Trump's, um, uh, you know, um, what was that? Um, the codes uh, and the color coded uh, level of threat that was introduced in the US. These are all examples of moral panic. Um, to the various conspiracy theories, um, this is a familiar topic, I think, for us in the 21st century. Specifically in Russia, something I've been studying, um, the anti-LGBTQ plus uh, movements are um, all rooted in the spread of moral panic over uh, a direct comparison between homo, uh, homosexuality and pedophilia and perversion as well. So I wanted to show you actually an example of this. Um, Here's a post that somebody obviously is labeling, you know, they're, they're contesting this, but this is a post um, by someone who calls himself the left is evil. Um, and um, the post read, you know, this is the example of, of moral panic. When a, uh, the SB 145 bill was passed in California, which legalized um, uh, homosexual uh, relations, uh, that it's no longer seen as as inappropriate or deviant, um, this person wrote, pedophilia is now legal in California. Now a 21 year old could have sex with a, I think it said 14 year old and not be listed on the sex registry as a sex offender. This is unbelievable California. And this is just an example from social media of the kind of moral panic that people spread um, in order to uh, propagate, like you see in this image below, this kind of, you know, real threat to uh, uh, minority communities, right? That this is, you know, um, obviously a scary um, manifestation of uh, the oppression and um, a marginalization, uh, marginalization of minorities. Another poster that tries to um, create awareness um, against people who spread or for the people uh, who spread uh, moral panic. You see this quote, don't listen to rumors about AIDS, get the facts. And I wanted to show you another example actually of something that um, I encountered here in Toronto. So you have your uh, chart from the textbook that shows you sort of the flow of how moral panic can be um, propagated. But um, I wanted to show you an example of um, an article I stumbled upon. Where is it? Um, where a judge in Toronto um, discriminated against, here it is. Um, so the different types of victimization that the book covers Here's an unexpected case of victimization and stigma. Um, a judge in 2008 in Toronto um, refused to participate in a court hearing unless the um, uh, accused uh, person who was known to have AIDS, unless that person wears a mask. And um, it demonstrated not only ignorance about the disease, but also a, uh, I think a willful ignorance and discrimination against um, anyone with AIDS. So this is something so recent. And so, you know, I mean, this judge still practices, he wasn't like barred from his profession, but he showed clear signs of um, ignorance and, and discrimination, right? So um, in other words, um, Moral panic and victimization uh, take many different forms. So if we look at our theoretical approaches to deviance, conflict theory would propose that you have crime in society because powerful members um, enforce certain laws to their advantage that um, take a lot of power and privilege away from the minorities and that the minorities or other uh, 
members of society who are um, victimized or somehow slighted that they retaliate. And this is one explanation for the existence of crime. Um, so then with social inequality in mind, as I said, as a key ingredient in the understanding of deviance and crime, conflict theorists uh, view rule breaking as a rational behavior. When the deck is rigged or stacked against you, um, people take opportunities to try to get what they feel belongs rightfully to them. I had an interesting conversation on the subject with someone in Toronto who is quite wealthy and complained to me that their house was broken into uh, two times in the last decade. And they live in an affluent area um, in the GTA. And I tried to say um, politely that, you know, I think part of the reason that the multi-million dollar houses get attacked um, even in a fairly um, crime-wise uh, safe neighborhoods like Thornhill and, you know, the, the Vaughan community um, is because there's, there's such a disparity between these uh, neighborhoods with so much wealth and those where people are actually starving. And so I said, you know, um, this is something that is a systemic problem. And I wonder in countries where poverty is um, a lot less of an issue, how statistically crime is less likely based on this kind of conflict theory logic, right? Again, I don't have the statistics for that, but it is. it would be interesting to look at small West European countries where the social network is stronger, where healthcare is better, where education is all free, even post-secondary, and that, you know, maybe these um, quality of life elements lead to a lower chance of crime and deviance. So if we think also about um, conflict theory from Emile Durkheim, Durkheim's notion of uh, anime, um, which you can sort of think anime antinomies, like the, the conflict, um, uh, uh, the strain theory that resulted from this uh, proposes that deviant behavior results from unequal opportunities. So again, continuing this logic of the gaps that people perceive between what um, some are born into and others are not, right? Old money versus new money. So the concept of anime um, essentially, quote, refers to a widespread lack of commitment to shared values um, or standards and rules that need to regulate behaviors and aspirations of individuals. And um, that this is what unhinges uh, the uh, social constraints on behavior. So uh, Durkheim argued that, quote, anime resulted from rapid social change. So when you have uh, traditional institutions crumbling, the church um, would be one example. So religious, um, religious constraints, you know, the Ten Commandments or whatever other religious uh, prohibitions for uh, most deviant behaviors, most common deviant behaviors. And when the society becomes secular and does not necessarily um, wholly believe in the religious explanations of why thou shall not kill or steal or etc., cetera, um, then um, this leads to uh, unrest and, um, uh, possibility of a greater possibility of deviant behavior arising. If we look at the feminist theory, like conflict theory, feminist theory also focuses on inequality, as you know, specifically between men and women. And women, um, our book suggests, because of their powerlessness, are often more likely to commit um, property crimes, theft, and fraud. So not violent crimes, but the nonviolent type in order to kind of achieve some level of power. I wanted to give you a literary example, as you know, literature is um, 
my passion um, and to consider the kind of more old fashioned crimes of, for example, adultery that led to novels like The Scarlet Letter, um, Hawthorne's uh, famous 19th century novel about a woman whose husband um, uh, is not uh, uh, around and uh, she gets raped and is prosecuted for adultery, um, despite the fact that she did not choose to commit adultery. And that, um, you know, in this time period, some women were even sentenced to death for such um, crime, whereas the construction of uh, the same value was different for men. You have your chart in the book that shows through the feminist theory perspective, a comparative analysis of um, uh, criminal violations uh, based on gender. And um, I don't particularly know um, if you find this kind of chart useful, but I think it's interesting to compare um, levels of homicide, you know, are significantly higher among men than women. Um, as um, are all of these violent crimes, um, fraud would, as you see, as the feminist theory suggests, is not the uh, like disparity between fraud uh, between the genders is not as um, high, and prostitution is uh, almost well, not quite, but almost equal between the two. So. Again, you could draw some conclusions from that. Um, but I think it's important to understand again that we're looking at um, society from the perspective of intersectionality. And so the different um, subject positions that lead to different behaviors, ethnicity, race, class, gender, that this is a complex web of analysis and that we should never boil down criminality to uh, something that could be seen as just through males versus females, etc. Functionalist uh, like Durkheim uh, also viewed deviance as beneficial to society, but that uh, essentially, why is it? Because we want to establish a baseline of good behavior and then have punishments for deviance. Um, so that we deter people from committing crimes. So social control theory would be uh, a way to describe this and that um, social control theorists essentially argue that people follow rules when they believe that they will benefit from following these rules. So this theory assumes that um, pretty much everyone has deviant um, tendencies or impulses, but for most people, these um, impulses are not acted upon because they see the benefits of following the rules, right? That um, if you choose uh, not to plagiarize on your assignments, then you will reap the benefits of both learning and achieving good grades and status in society. And uh, those who plagiarize clearly um, then don't see the benefit of doing their own work. Um, this is something, again, in the context of academic um, honesty is something that can be seen from a conflict perspective. For example, students who are um, under a lot of um, social, financial, family, mental health pressures, you know, I've seen a number of cases where dealing with a case of plagiarism, a student broke down into tears to say, I felt like I had no other choice, right? And I would argue that, you know, there is always another choice um, when it comes to uh, academic honesty, at least. Um, it is not a matter of life or death and reaching out to your professors and asking for extra help rather than um, cheating on an assignment is always a good um, uh, rule of thumb. But again, I, I do agree with the conflict theorists that there are social pressures that lead students to act desperately and that I don't judge this. I just am acknowledging that this is the reality in which we exist. So what does our society try to do to help 
people avoid deviance. In the case of education, you know, professors give you workshops to attend on proper citation. Um, we also try to uh, share resources that help you to do your own work, um, honestly. In this unprecedented case of the pandemic, with resources perhaps um, less accessible than otherwise, again, um, the responsibility of, of making sure you're on top of your work falls on you, the individual. And that's true for both teachers and students. And so how do we think about um, how, what best practices uh, we can employ in order to protect ourselves from um, desperate behavior? That's a question I leave you to think about for now. Um, and we can discuss it in our live class. In, uh, the symbolic interactionist uh, theories, um, a key concern uh, around deviance is how people interact with other people to become deviant, right? I mean, you know, in Russian, we have all kinds of um, sort of idiomatic expressions about, you know, if you hang out with a bad crowd, you are going to end up being bad, you know, and so on and so forth, the kinds of things you've heard from your parents. But um, don't forget that a lot of these common wisdom kind of um, ways of seeing the world often incorporate stigma, you know, that we should not think that countercultural movements like the goth or hard rock or Wicca or any of these um, groups, the, you know, sort of bikers and, and uh, it used to be that tattoo artists were very much associated with criminality, et cetera, not really the case anymore, but that we should be careful not to judge people by their appearance, obviously. So um, more to the point, um, if we think about how social deviance is learned or encouraged, you know, kids learn through social games, through participating in um, social activities. And it does seem that um, there are, for example, gender constructions around behavior that lead more boys to act aggressively than girls do, you know? And this is something that, um, again, um, uh, you can consider thinking about um, violent crime and what is um, typically seen as the triggers or associated environments where violent crime arises. So as I suggested, you know, I really do like to believe that a decrease in violence um, is a result of a society that has means to support their uh, uh, people, social members, and that, um, the, the higher uh, social support um, for individuals of a society, the less likely violence um, arises. So civility is related directly to the kind of social support networks that we have. And um, age and gender, as I said, are also important factors. It is statistically true that young men are more likely than older men um, or women to commit violent acts, but this is still, remember, a generalization. Um, so, for example, uh, men are, I think, or young men in particular, are encouraged to show, you know, bravery and all kinds of behavior that is valorized in Hollywood or through video games, where then Mem such members of our society embrace this kind of um, violent competitive behavior and that this gets replicated um, in real life. And then finally to wrap up, nonviolent crime also has many, many variations, but most of it has to do with trying to get more money or property without inflicting harm upon uh, another. So um, there are professional nonviolent crimes, you know, actual um, uh, fraud artists, you know, who end up 
embezzling a lot of money. And there are amateur ones where um, the nonviolent crime could be stealing something from a local store, you know, something um, that is uh, one time and not constitutional, right? So um, if you think about the type of higher professional um, uh, crime uh, that is nonviolent, we have the term white collar crime. And, you know, some of the most famous um, People with lots of money, you know, celebrities and so on have been accused of white collar crime, which includes evasion of taxes um, and, you know, other um, ways of structuring your business that is illegal and um, uh, deviant, right? Uh, so in contrast to that, there is uh, a lot of uh, small scale nonviolent crime, different street crimes where um, uh, shot, as I said, shoplifting or uh, vandalism of some sort, which doesn't necessarily even occur for um, personal gain. But, you know, you see teenagers um, graffitiing um, inappropriate uh, language or images on perhaps places that they resent. Um, some of these crimes are sometimes motivated uh, by other ideologies uh, or, you know, for example, hate crimes. I went to a talk last year uh, with a gentleman who survived the Holocaust and um, in his area here in Richmond Hill where he lives, um, he witnessed uh, some graffiti that expressed anti-Semitic uh, um, uh, sentiment that, you know, this was basically um, crime against the Jewish people. And this is a, an example of a street crime, which is not directly violent, but it is absolutely uh, deviant, ugly, and um, uh, undesirable. It is a hate crime, right? Um, car theft, uh, certain types of assault, and of course, homicide should not be under nonviolent crime. Sorry, this is, um, uh, I suppose, um, considered unintended as opposed to murder, but uh, I would not personally categorize homicide um, under nonviolent crime. So, I mean, I think just with this kind of sweeping overview of the chapter. We can talk more closely about it tomorrow. Um, technology and crime is something that is more uh, recent and unexplored. Um, cyberspace is a term we use for describing the virtual environment in which people communicate um, among various networks such as Zoom and the social media platforms and so on and so forth. Cyberbullying is what has been coined as a term for harassment online in the cyberspace. And I offer to you, if you have time to read this, uh, an article from just a few months ago in the New York Times. Uh, it's about a mother who talks about losing her son um, to basically raise awareness about the kind of cyberbullying that happens as a result of hate towards LGBTQ community and youth in particular. Her son uh, was, I guess, um, uh, he expressed ideas online that led people to label him as uh, gay, although he uh, identified as bisexual, and all the bullying and humiliation that he faced led him to commit suicide. So cyberbullying is a very, very serious issue, something that um, I hope you hadn't experienced, but if you have, um, this is something not to dismiss. This is something not to take lightly. There are um, all kinds of uh, services that help to um, report and uh, investigate and punish cyberbullying. So please know that always we have to be aware of the kind of um, threat of harassment that faces us online as well as in real life. And so 
if you think about um, the uh, context of technology's role uh, in spreading crime, you want to think about um, what has enabled more um, crime to arise in the cyberspace that we live in. Um, so again, in the examples that I know, um, decriminalizing uh, gay marriage has led to some serious backlash and a lot of cyberbullying um, in the US and Russia and several other places in the world. So uh, people get victimized. As I said, there are, um, you know, basically uh, more obvious examples of the kinds of people who get victimized. Um, and hotspots is a term that refers to places in uh, areas, speci specifically in large cities where um, more crime is uh, um, uh, observed, reported, um, committed, and that, you know, these areas are typically more heavily policed. So um, the routine activity theory has uh, a useful uh, Venn diagram, which shows you the uh, sort of the pinnacle of uh, crime or what makes crime arise. Um, the ingredients are presence of targets or opportunities to commit crime. So vulnerable communities, you can say. A motivation to commit crime. In other words, again, uh, people who have been uh, um, somehow uh, underprivileged in society. And then also absence of capable guardianship to prevent crime. Right, so victims, those who are motivated to commit crime and not enough um, uh, guardianship or police force to prevent crime. So when we think about victimization, I think um, uh, victim precipitation theory asks us to think how a victim's characteristics or interactions with an offender may contribute to the crime being committed. This is a complicated topic, but essentially um, there are um, certain behaviors that people will use to suggest um, uh, that the victim was in part responsible for their uh, for the attack upon them. And some of these take really nasty, nasty forms. For example, if you've ever heard uh, some of these conservative voices talk about how women who dress in a way that is um, sexually taunting or slutty would be the, the simple word for that, that they essentially ask to be raped. And I think that this is um, a disgusting line of thought that no one should ever propagate. Um, so uh, to wrap up, finally, um, social control and punishment. Um, you know, it would be great if all we needed in society was uh, methods for deterring um, criminal activity. And, um, you know, essentially, the um, system of having fines and uh, certain um, detainment and, uh, you know, taking away of certain liberties, uh, or just financial uh, consequences for crime and that everybody would look at it and say, yes, committing crime is not worth this kind of penalty. Uh, this would be pure deterrence. There are much, much more um, forceful, harsh uh, punishments for crime. The harshest, I believe, is the capital punishment, um, which I think is um, outdated for our society and yet it exists in a number of places in the US and other places in the world. So uh, death penalty um, essentially is something that is, um, I'm curious what you think, but that is I think a, an incredibly problematic form of punishment because of course uh, of the most obvious critique of it is that if you um, accuse someone wrongfully and they did not commit the crime and this is discovered after their death penalty 
um, then there's nothing you can do about it, right? So that's something we should really keep in mind. Um, the idea of rehabilitation though, um, is that uh, whatever punishment is used, it is uh, aimed towards reform of criminals into socially uh, law-abiding members of society. And that is a much better model, I would uh, suggest than any of these harsh kind of punishments like life imprisonment or capital punishment. Um, parole is, is a term simply that means that a prisoner is released before the completion of their sentence um, because they have demonstrated good behavior and promised to continue their good behavior. And um, I think, again, some conflict theory would suggest that um, the more affluent members of society um, get to have parole much more often than those who come from uh, lack of financial strength. And that's a topic for another day. Um, so finally, the prisonization theory um, is uh, a term that I would say is uh, in my mind associated with the problem of uh, life incarceration or really, really long-term incarceration, especially for crimes that are um, not, you know, proven to be absolutely uh, the most egregious, systematic, you know, I mean, we're not, I'm not thinking of serial killers or, you know, serial um, violent offenders, but I'm thinking about um, people whose crimes uh, did not merit, let's say, two decades of prison, because what happens in prison to um, a lot of people who weren't hard criminals is that they degrade to the level of prison life and become um, incapable of it reintegrating into society. And this is where the term recidivism describes people who come out of prison and recommit crimes because they have learned that that's their base you know, norm for behavior. So uh, uh, last couple of terms to recap for you from the chapter surveillance. This is something, again, you can look at Mikhail Foucault's um, work on the Panopticon. Um, and uh, uh, the book is called Discipline and Punish, if you're interested in any of this. Um, so surveillance is a concept of close observation that you're constantly watched. And Foucault actually argues in Discipline and Punish that our society has become a society of constant surveillance and that even when nobody is watching, we have this police kind of figure in our mind that it makes us feel um, that we are constantly watched. Um, so uh, if you think about this um, uh, in relation to uh, kinds of feelings of paranoia and the problems with mental health. Some interesting ideas could emerge out of making these connections. Um, and finally, restorative justice um, is a set of approaches to criminal punishment aimed to ensure that criminals take responsibility for the actions and that um, the state of community after um, the crime is seen through uh, legal processes and the punishment um, and also the supports for the victims restore a kind of sense of well-being and health within the community or the state. So um, I hope you found this chapter engaging. I know it's close to the end of term. It is almost December and um, the quiz on this uh, again is just my way of checking in with you. I noticed last week when we had a chapter with no quiz, um, only half the class watched the lecture. So I suppose these um, quizzes, if anything, um, enforce a certain um, punishment um, system upon those who um, do not um, want or have the opportunity to do the work. I have to say I'm not a fan of discipline and punishment uh, or, you know, a kind of surveillance approach to education. So next week we will not have a quiz, but I hope you read the chapter on mass media and I hope that we have a productive review session of the final chapters of our semester before um, we head into our exam week.
please prepare good questions for me to address for you in the review week next week. And uh, please make sure you finalize your memoir assignment and bring it to class um, so that if there are any remaining questions about any of the theories we had covered, that I can help you to navigate those and answer your questions as best as I can. Enjoy the rest of your week and I will see you soon. Take care.